Hello viewers and welcome to another match of Warhammer 40,000 Conquest. My name is Mitch and I am the Hive Tyrant. Today begins my coverage of the spring 2016 season of Sam Mann's Black Crusade, his online Conquest LCG competitive league because of technical difficulties we saw no week one featured match, but today for week two we have Christopher Dale Bates versus Kevin Warrender. At the bottom of our screen, played by Christopher, we have Packmaster Kith, and uh, up top to the north, we instead see On She, piloted by Kevin Warrender. Looks like our Tau player begins the game with initiative, and I believe both of our players decided to keep their opening hands. Bear in mind that planet number one is going to be Planum, which allows you to move a non warlord unit, and it looks like our opening deploy action for On She that that armor bane favoring Tau Warlord is an ethereal envoy positioned at planet number three. Uh, that's Iridial the Healing Planet, and that's potentially going to be one card earned for on she We've got a copy of Kith's Chimera Masters at planet number one. It's a one-two for two. It's already started generating Chimera tokens for Kith, and uh, provided that Kith does win this planet, that'll allow her the opportunity to shift this unit or the Chimera or any other non-warlord to any other planet, whether that's to harass the enemy warlord, or set herself up for another round, whatever it is it happens to be. And uh, considering planets 1, 2, and 3, as well as 5, all have blue technology icons, this could be a rather quick game, especially in the context of having planet 1 being planum, just because it allows you a... Uh, fantastic amount of early game action advantage. Opposite the Kith's Chimera Masters, we've got a 1-2 ranged Vior Law Marksman and uh, assessing on She's hand, he's got a copy of Subduel, where you can place supports or attachments back onto the owner's uh, top of their deck, so you could get rid of your opponent's Orbital City or Chimera Den or forward barracks when they're relying on it most. We've also got a copy of the Ennui Prelate, which uh, can ambush into play, boost all friendly Tau units, provide an attack bonus, that is, and uh, it can swing for four, which alongside on she uh, could well be Armor Bane. So on she is a Tau Warlord, definitely favors playing a bit of a command game in addition to uh, just doing the Warlord assassination thing. Here at Planet 4, we've also got a second copy of the Ethereal Envoy. All of these Ethereal units bounce back to the HQ after they strike, and then in assessing the remainder of our Tau player's hand, uh, he does have initiative at Planet number 1, unless the enemy Warlord shows up and on she does not. We've got a copy of Deception to bounce a non-elite uh, Dark Eldar unit back to hand, and then apart from that, we've just got a copy of a Borkon Recruit, which could potentially swing for four Armor Bane uh, in the presence of a Warlord, and uh, just remember that on she as an Ethereal, after he himself attacks, he also is moved to his HQ, uh, but he himself attacks for two Armor Bane, and every Tau unit at his planet also swings with Armor Bane. Packmaster Kith really only generates these Chimera. She herself is a 2-6. Uh, Kith has got three two-shield value cards in hand, uh, but against the likes of on she uh, all the shields in the world don't necessarily do a whole hell of a lot of good for you. We've got two copies of uh, Chaos Fanatics at planets 2 and 3, but thanks to Deception, one of those was bounced to hand, and uh, Brain Damaged Chris at the bottom here only has one resource remaining, and uh, I was going to say, were it not for Raid, which can be played right now, that would mean that Kith is essentially shit out of luck when it comes to getting out any additional units. Uh, that's going to be minus one resource for Kevin, plus one resource for Chris, and uh, now Chris is going to have a sufficient amount of resources with which to either put Shadowfield onto one of his units, uh, like the Kith's Chimera Masters, to make it immune to two or lower cost enemy army units, or, well, any army units, uh, but of course it looks like Chris instead decided to put out Chaos Fanatics, so he decided to play this to uh, Planet 4 instead of Planet number 3. Two command icons beats one, and that's going to be a great opportunity for Chris to potentially win the two resources associated with that planet 
planet, but uh, now I can imagine that Kith is not going to be arriving at Farin, uh, the route, a unit planet. Both of our players are currently deciding where exactly they want to send their respective warlords. At planet number one, the marksman is only going to be able to shoot for one. Looks like both players are going to be showing up at planet number one, so this is going to be pretty interesting. Kith is going to have two Chimera tokens at that planet. I definitely wasn't necessarily expecting that, but it's not as if I had a large amount of time to process uh, what exactly could happen. But Anshi is going to give this Viorla Marksman Armor Bane. It's going to be able to shoot for one, kill a Chimera token guaranteed, and then Anshi with initiative will be able to clear out an additional Chimera token. But then, uh, if that's the case, he bounces back to HQ. The Chimera Masters and Kith can kill the Viorla Marksman. Then that is going to be the planet one uh, for Anshi. But in regard to command struggles, Chris got two cards, two resources. Kevin instead just got one card. He came across a copy of the Irrelevant to our current combat shrouded harlequin a 2-1 army unit when it's destroyed you can exhaust a target enemy unit which does include warlords and uh, as pros uh, as combat is in the process of going on that marksman does indeed snap off a shot during the range skirmish round to kill a chimera and uh chris got a copy of slith mercenary as well as promotion so all these beautiful shield cards are going to be uh kind of just insignificant irrelevant to our current battle, Anshi attacks, kills that Chimera token, and then Anshi's forced reaction is going to trigger, and he's going to be moved back to his HQ. So there's no homing beacon, there's no uh, income to be gained from that happening to Anshi, and here we go. That is going to be Kith taking a swing. The Viorla Marksman is killed, and now there's going to be no better opportunity than the present for uh, Kith to move, uh, maybe it could be this Chaos Fanatics to planet number three to trump that ethereal envoy in regard to its command. Uh, no, it looks like it's going to be the copy of Kith's Chimera Masters moved from our current planet number one to planet number three to break even. Uh, that is going to be a green and a blue icon for Kith. We're going to go through an HQ phase. That's four resources, two cards for each of our players, and uh, Packmaster Kith is coming across a large number of uh, rather formidable combat units. Bloodied Reavers is the Dark uh, dark Eldar equivalent of the Borkon recruits. It can potentially swing for four. Uh, granted, Anshi is going to be able to kill it with his two-swing armor bane, but now uh, the initiative token is not in our Tau player's possession, and if both warlords show up at planet number one, uh, that's going to be the Bloodied Reavers having the opportunity to swing for Anshi uh, for four uh, before he can do anything about about it. Anshi has got a copy of Kalyan Strike. For the cost of one, as a combat action, you can move any number of ethereal units you control to a target planet, so the Envoys and Anshi can all collapse on one planet. You could have Anshi go to, say, planet number two, trigger a battle at that planet, then he'll go back to his HQ, then you could use Kalyan Strike to move Anshi to, say, planet number three, kill off this Chaos Fanatics, trigger that battle ability to rout uh, another unit, of Kith's, if she were to say, put something at planet number five here. So, Shrouded Harlequin sitting at planet number one, it's going to be one command icon versus three, but when it's destroyed, we might see Packmaster Kith exhausted. Uh, Kalyan Strike could also allow an interesting opportunity here. We could have Anshi swing... I guess twice at Packmaster Kith. If, uh, like, let's say Kith goes to a planet, the Shrouded Harlequin ends up exhausting Kith. We could see Anshi swing. Well, I guess Anshi doesn't have initiative, which kind of screws it up. But in some situations, you can use Kalyan Strike to uh, swing with, I guess, you know, the same units multiple times. But regardless, we've got a copy of the Slith Mercenary positioned at planet number five for the cost of one. It's potentially going to pull in two resources for Kith, and now I guess we've got scarcely few resources for Kevin. He's going to want to get some income to uh, perhaps try to bloody Kith with 
perhaps surprisingly dumping a Ennui Prelate into play, like uh, the Prelate can boost on she up to attack value 3. So let's see, we've got Kevin having passed, we've got uh, Kith with just a fantastic command game promotion on the Chimera Masters at planet number 2, boosts it up to 3 command icons, it trumps that Ethereal Envoy, and of course uh, the pair of Slith Mercenaries here at planets 4 and 5 are going to be fantastic uh, for Kith. Uh, <laughs> there was a little bit of talk uh, before this match as to how long the duration would go, and it looks like Kevin is not favoring his odds, saying it might take uh, 15 minutes or less for uh, Chris to win, but let's see. Uh, Chris calls out, of course, that uh, Kevin can deal a tremendous amount of armor bane damage, so uh, even though on she's not doing great economically, uh, things could change at any time with the warlord death of packmaster kith so kith goes to planet number one to maintain initiative had on she shown up that would have been the bloodied reavers being able to outfoot out put four points of damage uh this shrouded harlequin could result in an exhausted kith or something else but it's looking like it's probably going to uh go to waste kevin is only going to come across two resources having sent on she to planet number three but of course he's now got a sufficient number of resources for the Ennui Prelate, plus a copy of Kalyan Strike, so Kith could still end up taking a fair bit of damage. Uh, Kevin, like I said, got two resources, whereas Packmaster Kith got four cards and three resources. Kith, one of the cards she has come across is going to be the Agonizer of Bren, so without Armor Bane to benefit it, an Ennui Prelate can indeed swing for four, but the Agonizer of Bren could decrease that down to one, and a copy of Warp Storm, Shadowfield, and Raid are also going to provide a large number of shields, and Warp Storm could even be used to throw some damage onto on she and uh, this Ethereal Envoy, or they could just be saved for the following round, but uh, Chris also came across a copy of Archon's Palace to further uh, put a vice grip on our Tau player's economy. Here at planet number one, of course, Kith has initiative. That's going to be a swing of two from this Chimera token, and uh, that Shrouded Harlequin is going to be destroyed unless we see Kalyan Strike discarded as a shield, and that would about suck to have to get rid of that effect um, you know, for its shield value. Chris and Kevin have an equivalent number of resources, so this isn't really great for Kevin to purchase control of either of these Slith mercenaries. Uh, so the Shrouded Harlequin is indeed going to be destroyed, and that is going to be Packmaster Kith exhausted. Are we going to see the Ennui Prelate or not? What I guess we could see, uh, like it kind of sucks that the Bloodied Reavers is ready to attack for four, but we could see the Ennui Prelate like, I guess, first of all, we could see Kalyan Strike move on she to... Okay, here's Kalyan Strike. Is it going to move on she to planet number one? It's going to be the Ethereal Envoys. All right, so maybe it's going to be all of them. On she, the Ethereal Envoys, and now I can only imagine we'll also see an Ennui Prelate dump into play, so the Prelate itself is going to be able to attack for four Armor Bane versus Kith, and then the Prelate is going to give a plus one attack value bonus, uh, which persists until the end of the phase to each and every other Tau faction unit present. There's the Ennui Prelate, and now I can only imagine we'll see a bloodied Packmaster Kith, but the, uh, like, uh, an Ethereal Envoy here is going to be able to to attack for two, that'll be a dead bloodied reavers, we could have another ethereal envoy, and uh, the ennui prelate resulting in a bloodied packmaster kith, and now this is looking pretty interesting indeed, so, uh, Kevin, it looks like he's about to deal out some punishment to our dear packmaster, so, uh, the economic vice grip is ongoing, but if you can assassinate packmaster kith, and I believe on her bloodied side, she's a 1-5, uh, then things go all the way bad for you very quickly indeed, and if our, uh, Tau Warlord gets some of his combo pieces, uh, this could indeed be Dear Kevin's game. So if it were me, I'd use Ethereal Envoy number one, clear out a bloodied Reavers, just so I don't 
deal with a swing of four in return. The Chaos Fanatics aren't going to be able to clear out anything, and then we could say uh, the Ennui Prelate plus another Ethereal Envoy would be a bloodied Packmaster Kith, and then on she himself can swing for three, and I guess you may as well end up killing that copy of Chaos Fanatics. You're not going to be able to take uh, the planet. Interestingly here, this is going to be the Ennui Prelate taking a swing at Packmaster Kith. I guess uh, something, well, uh, yeah, so sorry. Kevin doesn't have the information I do, so he had to call out for actions, and there was no Archon's Terror. Uh, perhaps that's what he was afraid of in uh, kind of uh, dealing out his sequence of attacks as he is, because Kith has taken damage, the Ennui Prelate bounces away from that planet, and now the Bloodied Reavers is going to be able to kill one of these two attack Armor Bane Ethereal Envoys because, uh, not that... Kith knows that Kevin can't shield, uh, but Subduel is going to be insufficient to uh, protect one of these units. Looks like the Bloodied Reavers is actually taking a swing at on she and uh, seeing as how the next round's first planet is going to be Iridial, uh, that's going to be a very interesting choice just because on she is going to be heavily incentivized to show up at that planet, uh, but Warp Storm and all manner of other effects could just pay off well, I guess maybe what we'll end up seeing is if the Chaos Fanatics can deal another point of damage to on she then Warp Storm could potentially bloody him if it wasn't for the fact that Subduel is a thing in Kevin's hand. So, that is going to be a bloodied Packmaster Kith, the Ethereal Envoy, two points of damage, Armor Bane, two plus four is six, and my elementary school mathematics is paid off, as has Kevin's, because Packmaster Kith is now bloodied. A 1-5 is the only thing that stands between... I guess, um, just the, the end of this game, and, uh, our, I guess the end of this game, and the current ongoing nature of this game. Chaos Fanatic swing for one at on she He blocks it thanks to the interjection of that subduel, essentially useless here. And now on she is going to be able to kill the bloodied reavers. Well, I guess the Ethereal Envoy will want to attack first because it wants Armor Bane. That's the bloodied reavers gone, and unfortunately our Tau player has run out of tricks to end up winning at planet number one. And uh, I guess it's going to be up to Kith now to, uh, like, I guess, let's see. On she takes a swing, kills the Chimera token, as opposed to dealing uh, with the two command icon Chaos Fanatics. They're a 1-2, but they'll be showing up during the next round exhausted, so they're not going to contribute their command icons. I can only imagine that Packmaster Kith is going to be using her Warp Storm shortly uh, to target the enemy HQ, where there's currently three three-hit point units and a 4 damage on she. There's that Warp Storm, and now let's see how exactly things go. If only Kith had one more resource and another copy of Warp Storm, uh, it would practically be GG right now, but that is not the case. This is going to be a fast and furious match. Uh, that is going to be another Planet 1 uh, by Packmaster Kith, and this is going to be very interesting indeed. If Kith is going to be able to win at the next round's Planet number 2, if Kith can load up that planet with units, uh, then that could potentially allow her to win the game because even if Kith shows up at like planet, uh, let's say next rounds two, three, four, or five, uh, Kith won't be able to be destroyed before Kith potentially wins the game here. So, uh, planet number one, Elowith is captured. Kith gets to look at the top three cards of her deck, add one of those cards to her hand. Kith gets another copy of, uh, well, as we've gone through an HQ phase now, that's four resources, two cards for each of our players. Kith's chosen card was an Archon's Terror. Kith gets her Chimera Den, but it's not going to be very useful without any Chimera in play. And now what exactly did on she get? First of all, on she is going to have to send himself to planet number one. He's only got one hit point, but he does have initiative. All of these units are going to be showing up exhausted at that planet, but on she does have a copy of Gun drones, and on she will have a copy of Borkon recruits uh, that on she is going to be able to put um, at that planet. Earthcast Technician touches down on planet number one. That's going to be a copy of Auxiliary Armor. Uh, Kevin, unfortunately, does not have enough resources to do Borkon recruits 
plus auxiliary armor, which could attack for six armor bane that could have killed Packmaster Kith. But at planet number one, we've of course got a copy of Siren Zithlex, and this is where things are going to get pretty interesting here. So brain damage, Chris at the bottom of our screen has got three resources remaining. He's going to be getting a fair few resources during uh, the command phase. Kith, I can only imagine, is going to be going to planet number five. Anything that Kevin deploys at planet number one is going to be arriving into play exhausted uh, thanks to Siren Zithlex here. Kith has only got a 1-2 and a 2-3, which is not a whole hell of a lot. Uh, Kith is going to be able to use an Archon's Terror to get rid of one formidable enemy unit, but it might actually be reasonably difficult for Kith to win at planet number one just because there's not a large number of enemy units uh, capable of being like uh, Kith has only got the Siren Zithlex and the Chimera Masters to kill some of these units, so even though they're grievously wounded, uh, it's going to be difficult for her to overcome. There's a Gun Drones on this copy of Earthcast Technician. If on she shows up at that planet, he'll maintain initiative that could be area effect to Armor Bane, dealing you know enough damage to kill the Chimera Masters, enough damage to almost kill Siren Zithlex, uh, but then our Siren will be able to swing... Uh, uh, auxiliary armor could prevent her from bloodying on she and then on she might be able to heal away all of this damage uh, but of course archon's terror could remove this copy of earth cast technician and things are going to be very interesting here so i can only imagine that on she is going to be going to planet number one looks like kith goes to planet number three as opposed to planet number five, because there's a void pirate there. Uh, Kith used a copy of Archon's Palace to deny the one card bonus at planet number one. And let's see how on she is going to get himself out of this one. The game could potentially come down to this planet. On she is going to be able to have to defend planet number one. Otherwise, uh, he loses. So three cards and six resources in total for Chris, and uh, absolutely no income whatsoever for on she. So, what's nice is that Kith is sitting at Aatrox Prime. Let's say that on she wins planet number one, on she will strip all of the damage off of him, but then Aatrox Prime is going to fire, and that is going to be three dead Tau faction units. So, Kith is going to have to avoid assassination for the remainder of the game, and uh, looks like Kith is going to have to try and reassess some sort of victory condition, like uh, winning at planet either three or starting to pick up green strongpoint icons at winning at, I suppose, our current planet number five, the last planet in play. We're going to see a battle break out at planet number one, and I guess it all comes down to uh, if we see Archon's Terror, that will remove the Earthcast Technician. Uh, on she can swing, kill the Chimera Masters. Siren Zithlex can swing it on she. Um, like, okay, so let's see here. There's no Archon's Terror, so it looks like Gun Drones is going to resolve. That's a dead Chimera Master. Uh, Siren Zithlex takes just one point of damage. Note that the Earthcast Technician, when it bounces back to the Tau Player's HQ, that's going to be Aatrox Prime firing at that as well, so on she is going to be healed, uh, but all of these other units may die unless, yeah, no, Auxiliary Armor is going to have to be used right now to prevent this bloodying so on she is uh, saved from being bloodied by siren zithlex who took a swing there now it's going to be on she swinging for two and removing this unit and uh and then I guess it's going to be uh, the Tau winning this planet, and uh, that's going to be on she stripping six points of damage off of himself. He's going to add one planet type icon of each color to his victory display, but uh, it's definitely going to come at a dear price. So it's going to be on she getting absolutely wrecked in economy, and uh, it's going to be all about whether or not he can manage to hunt down Packmaster Kith successfully. So that is going to be. 
this planet one, it's going to be all of the damage off of Anshi, but all of these Tau units are going to bounce to Anshi's HQ. Aatrox Prime is going to fire, and that is going to be, oh, uh, what is that? Three, four, five, a uh, total of nine resources and five cards, all destroyed by one Aatrox Prime bombardment. So that is one hell of an effect. And uh, I guess let's see what Packmaster Kith here can do. Uh, this is going to be a rather long game, it looks like, unless Anshi can seriously get his shit together and destroy Packmaster Kith. Uh, but it's all going to come down to, uh, I guess we'll just have to see how the game resolves. So Kevin says, you just felt bad for me. And uh, this is a very interesting back and forth just earlier today on the uh, Facebook group. Uh, Facebook group, people were talking about whether the game all comes down to command or not, and I think this uh, instance of on she here is very much going to show that uh, with some clever piloting, um, if you can manage to, you know, destroy the enemy warlord, then it doesn't really matter how well the enemy player is doing in regard to uh, command. So, here's what we've got now. Another HQ phase has come and gone. Four resources, two cards for each player. Unfortunately, we do not have six resources or you know more because we've now got another Anwi prelate which can be ambushed into play it can boost up on she and it can potentially hit packmaster kith for four maybe armor bane if on she is present at the same planet uh, but now it's all going to come down to kind of predicting where exactly packmaster kith goes there's no kalyan strike or xim yen orbital city to strategically relocate on she to uh, verify, ensure that he's going to be able to hunt down the Packmaster, and uh, it's all going to be up to Chris to continue dodging our, uh, you know, Tau Faction Warlord here. Chris doesn't have a large number of combat units in hand, but he's got an Archon's Terror, which can remove an Ennui Prelate, should it get dropped into play, and, uh, if there's no armor bane damage, then Chris has got a whole hell of a lot of uh, shield cards in hand. Uh, an Earthcast technician finds a heavy marker drone, but it's not as if there are a lot of desirable targets for it. Uh, interestingly, our planet number one, Farron, is the route planet, so uh, Kith, presuming she'll be able to win at planet number one, uh, she'll be able to route, maybe there's Earthcast Technician or a Borkon Recruit, uh, really anything else that gets dropped into play, and uh, right now, Kith is heavily advantaged just in regard to how many numbers she's got at her disposal. Uh, she's got another Void Pirate to cement, uh, locking down her economy here, trying to think about where would the best destination for Anshi be. Like, Anshi could arrive at Planet 2 and kill a Slith Mercenary, but then he's going to be bouncing away, and then if Aatrox Prime triggers for Kith, that's going to be a point of damage dealt to Anshi. Anshi has already got one point of damage, and there's no more Iridial on the tabletop to verify that he's going to be able to be healed, uh, but this Heavy Marker Drone may as well be used as a shield for Anshi. And uh, let's see, for Packmaster Kith... Planet number one would be, I guess, a decent option, just because I can't really envision Anshi arriving at that planet. I guess Anshi would, uh, or sorry, planet two would also be a decent choice for Kith, just because she could use her first combat action to run away if need be. It's nice that she's got initiative this round. Uh, planet number three, stealing a resource, could help to finish off uh, the Anshi player's economy, or I guess Kith could show up at planet number four, uh, just to try to successfully defend Taurus, uh, although I guess kind of the crap thing about Anshi is if Anshi shows up by his lonesome at four, takes a swing, kills this void pirate, he's going to have to be moved to his HQ, and then Anshi's not going to be able to uh, actually win at that planet. Uh, let's say if he tosses out his copy of Borkon Recruits, also at planet number four, he could win that battle, uh, but then I think Chris 
Bliss would be incentivized to use Archon's Terror to remove that Borkon recruit just to verify that his opponent isn't going to be able to draw three cards uh, to find Kaoyan Strike or Orbital Cities or any of those combo pieces which might allow our Tau player to successfully assassinate Kith. So 34 cards remaining for An Shi in his deck and uh, a mere 28 remaining for Kith. And of course, Kith is very nicely set up to win uh, just a fantastic amount of income during this round's command phase, but looks like both of our players are currently considering what exactly would be the best course of action at this point. So let's see what they do. Kevin decides to pass, and now it's all on Packmaster Kith. Kith decides to put out a copy of Chaos Fanatics, also at planet number two, and really each additional unit placed at any planet is just going to make it all the more difficult for An Shi to uh, kind of survive whatever it is going on. I guess Kith is maybe going to be showing up at planet number two, or otherwise Kith is just making absolute certain that uh, if An Shi arrives at planet number two, he'll not be able to kill off uh, enough enemy units to even get close to winning a battle at that planet, so Kith may not show up to planet number two just because if An Shi shows up at two, An Shi will trigger a battle and then uh, that'll result in, you know, our, our Tau warlord taking damage, but Kith does decide to go to planet number two. An Shi instead arrives at planet number four. That's going to be Taurus that An Shi is presumably not going to be able to trigger outside of the assistance of an Anwi prelate, and it definitely seems like a little bit of a waste. Um, let's see here. Looks like it was just one card and one resource won by our Tau player. He got a copy of the critically important Ximian Orbital City, which you can exhaust. Uh, it's a two-cost support. You could exhaust it as a combat action to move an ethereal unit from your HQ to a target planet and then ready it, which is going to be superb. That's exactly what he was hoping for when it comes to uh, potentially winning uh, this game and being able to assassinate uh, Packmaster Kith. And then just in regard to command phase income for Kith, uh, looks like there's maybe a little bit of difficulty with the octagon automation here, but it was two, three, four, five resources and one card in total uh, for Packmaster Kith. Interestingly, this Archon's Palace, uh, I guess, Yes, maybe it did not shut off this card bonus. Maybe it shut off the resource bonus, but it's definitely a shame that uh, the Orbital City did end up getting captured. And uh, interestingly, that Earthcast Technician is going to be routed by Farron, and uh, Farron being captured means that there is now one red planet-type icon in uh, Chris's HQ. So let's see. The ECT was routed, so it's not going to have any opportunity to potentially damage Kith, and uh, Aatrox Prime is going to fire at uh, the ECT and presumably kill it, uh, just because that would be awfully silly to, yeah, use a shield card to save it. And uh, Farron routing it may have seemed like a little bit of a waste when there were so many units that could have killed it regardless, but, you know, better safe than sorry, and every point of HP that Kith keeps uh, is going to be all the better for her. Uh, so what's very interesting is that during this next turn's round, it's going to all come down to on she being able to successfully prevent his opponent from capturing capturing uh, uh, this planet Aatrox Prime here. So Kith might show up, but Kith doesn't have initiative, and uh, frankly, I don't know if Kith showing up just to drop off a Chaos Fanatics and a Chimera Masters is going to be worth uh, the risk. So let's see, we go through presumably our final HQ phase. If Kith ends up winning the game, that's four resources and two cards for each of our players. Kith doesn't have a really, uh, really any formidable, well, I guess I spoke too soon. There is a copy of Bloodied Reavers, which could succumb to Armor Bane, there's also a Kith's Chimera Masters, and uh, there's an Agonizer of Bren, which could go on to one of these uh, units. There's nothing, unfortunately, with higher than 2 HP, so everything is going to fall equal prey to An Shi, who can attack, and then Ximian Orbital City can move him back to the planet for a bit of a double attack, uh, but it looks like we actually see a copy of Clavex War Leader, which... If it's put into play now, like, and you were to put a copy of, um, 
oh god, what is it? If you were to put a copy of uh, Agonizer of Bren on top of it, uh, then it would have enough HP to survive uh, an attack from Anshi, unless we see... Uh, okay. Oh, God, that sucks. All right, so I kind of missed it, but Pact of the Homunculi was played. Kith uh, sacrificed a copy of Kith's Chimera Masters. She drew two cards, one of which was a Clavax War Leader, and the enemy card randomly discarded was the Ennui Prelate. The Ennui Prelate could have given uh, on she plus one attack for the remainder of the phase, and because of the Orbital City, that could have been two attacks for three, which is enough to kill a uh, Clavax War Leader. Leader, but unfortunately, on we prelate having been discarded means that Kevin Warrender is a little bit out of luck. So shrouded Harlequin is now a thing, and that means that Packmaster Kith is going to be in a lot of trouble uh, because that might result in her being exhausted. But it seems like it might be a little bit too, uh, a little bit too little too late. In the context of uh, Kith is probably no way in hell going to be arriving at planet number one, and uh, if you if you lose the game by the time you have the opportunity to assassinate the enemy warlord, uh, then you are out of luck because you've already lost. But both of our players continue on with the deploy actions. Bloodied Reavers at planet number one for Kith. It's potentially going to be able to attack for four, provided that Anshi is at the planet long enough for it to attack. Uh, but if Anshi attacks, kills, say, a Slith mercenary, then bounces away, if Kith is not present, it's only attacking for two. But the crappy thing here is Kevin does not have much in the form of shield cards. The longer Anshi stays at the planet, the more damage he soaks up, but... You know, with 6 HP, he's not exactly invincible. There's only a 1 and a 2 shield value card in Anshi's hand, and uh, there's just a lot uh, sitting here in Kith's hand. So Kith has got a huge number of shield cards, but they're kind of going to be of questionable utility. Anshi himself is only going to be able to do, at most, two attacks. We've got a copy of Vashia Trailblazer at planet one. We've got a Borkon Recruits also at planet number one. Anshi is going to have initiative at planet number one, and I can only imagine that we'll probably see Packmaster Kith being sent to planet number three. Uh, but if Kith ends up winning planet number one, then that is going to be the game right there. Kith is looking like she's going to be winning... Uh, probably a total of one card, uh, and th I guess Kith is just going to have to hope that it is an Archon's Terror. Interestingly, we see a copy of a Shadowfield played on this bloodied Reavers, and I guess that's basically just saying, on she, please direct an attack, uh, uh, against this bloodied Reavers, because if on she doesn't do it, then, uh, at present, the, um, Actually, I'm sorry, the Bloodied Reavers uh, has no war gear, has no war gear attachments. Uh, so that is a small illegal play there. Uh, but whatever the shadow field ends up being affixed to, uh, since it's no longer going to be able to be killed by any of these two-cost enemy units, it's going to be up to uh, on she to destroy it. So we could see that on the Slith Mercenary. There's a ton of different options for it, but uh, let's... Uh, just, I guess, see what is going to happen. I guess Chris accidentally discards the shadow field. Uh, hopefully he'll just, uh, yeah, return it to, uh, you know, be attached to something else. I'll just say, agreed with Kevin. Uh, and let's see here. So Kevin's just got a couple of shield cards, but he's not going to be able to survive too much damage because of Kith. He doesn't have any attachments that he can really use even the odds with. Uh, he can only move attachments to... Uh, eligible units controlled by the same player, so he can't, like, steal a copy of Shadowfield, and it can only be affixed to Dark Eldar army units regardless. Uh, so let's see what happens. That is indeed Kith showing up at planet number three. That's going to be Anshi showing up at planet number one. And uh, is Archon's Palace going to shut off cards or resources at planet number one? I could only imagine it's going to be cards at planet number one. So this is going to be, uh, let's say, 
Anshi will kill uh, the bloodied Reavers here, and then it's going to be like an attack of two directed at something, uh, but I guess maybe... Kith has got Archon's Terror to remove a Borkon Recruits. Uh, Kith is going to be able to use a two-shield value card to, say, block the Slith Mercenary from killing the Shrouded Harlequin, uh, but Anshi can arrive back at the planet, kill something, and uh, I think it's possible... Well, I was going to say it's possible that uh, Anshi might be able to win the battle at planet number one, but this uh, Clavex War Leader and, of course, Warp Storm are definitely going to be complicating things. So let's see what happens. This was a total of just one resource for Kevin, and it was uh, three resources and a card for Kith. Uh, so Kevin's got no actions at planet number one. He does have the Ximian Orbital City. He's got three shields worth of cards in hand, but Anshi is only going to be able to attack twice until he's forever removed from that battle. And uh, Kith has got the Archon's Terror and the Clavex War Leader, uh, but not enough to do all of those with the Warp Storm. I suppose I wouldn't be shocked to see a Warp Storm used uh, just to, like, if you were to know that your opponent was out of shield cards... Warp Storm would be great just because you could clear all of this off and provided you've got at least something left yourself, uh, things could work out just fine. But it looks like the Borkon Recruits takes a swing for four Armor Bane, that bloodied Reavers is going to be destroyed, and now it is Slith Mercenary that uh, I can only imagine is going to be taking a shot at uh, the Shrouded Harlequin. So the longer you can delay Anshi himself attacking, uh, the better you can do. So the Slith Mercenary mercenary is taking a swing now, uh, perhaps at the Shrouded Harlequin, and I can only imagine when exactly are we going to see the Warp Storm, and when might we see Clavax War Leader, uh, just because I really think that uh, Kith's only hope for winning at this planet is going to be just scouring the face of Aatrox Prime of enemy units, but... It's not even necessarily going to be the end of the world if Kith does not win uh, at this planet, but it would definitely be nice uh, if Kith is able to win here. Uh, note that I guess I forgot about this copy of Chimera Den that can move to Chimera to planet number one after a Warp Storm. Uh, so I guess let's see. We could see Warp Storm, and then we could see these shield cards discarded to preserve Kith's own units, and uh, we're starting to run out of shield cards for on shield. The Slith Mercenary attacked something. Heavy Marker Drone was discarded as a shield. And now, what all are we going to see? We could see Warp Storm used now, and that would be all these damaged units. We could see Clavex War Leader uh, drop into play. If the Borkon Recruits is going to be damaged thanks to the discard of a one value shield card, the Clavex War Leader could finish it. On She takes a swing, removes the Slith Mercenary from that planet, and now, uh, it looks like this is going to be a great opportunity for the Chaos Fanatics to take an attack themselves. Interesting, I think, that uh, Anshi decided to attack as opposed to having the Shrouded Harlequin do the damaging for him. Uh, just because, again, you're going... Oh, I'm sorry, so Shrouded Harlequin is an Eldar faction unit, so it's not actually going to benefit from uh, Anshi, Curtis... Uh, Armor Bane, courtesy of on she So my bad there. Now I'm wondering if this is when we're going to be seeing that Warp Storm, because even the odds is going to be discarded, and uh, now that is no more shield cards in hand for Kevin. And uh, let's see, Shrouded Harlequin takes a swing, and I guess it's interesting that, all right, Chaos Fanatics are going to be killed... And now I suppose this may as well be the GG right here. We could see a Warp Storm, uh, and then if Warp Storm goes off, each and every unit sitting at this planet is going to be destroyed. We could see Chimera Den move two units to this planet, and uh, if that is the case, then Ximian Orbital City can move on she back to planet number one. On she will kill uh, a Chimera token, but then there's going to be one Chimera token remaining. Plus, we could see a Clavex War. 
War Leader dropped into play, and that would be the game for Chris here, so it looks like it's only going to be a matter of time, and uh, now what exactly are we going to see? We've got no resources and no cards, no unknown tricks for our Tau player, with the sole exception of the Xemian Orbital City, so for now, uh, from here on out, it should be clear to Chris that, uh, you know, he should know well uh, exactly what it is that he has to do. So thanks to Chimera Den, this is going to end up clinching the game for him, or uh, even a Clavex War Leader being dropped uh, at this planet post-Warp Storm would be able to survive an Armor Bane 2 value attack from Anshi, who would then be subsequently forced to uh, vacate the planet. Vashia Trailblazer takes a swing, and now what are we going to see? Interestingly, we see the Chimera Den used now, and I guess I'm not sure what exactly the thought process here is. Uh, I guess it's going to be a Chimera with the opportunity to attack and kill the Borkon recruits. No, it looks like it's going to be the Shrouded Harlequin. On she is going to be able to return to combat, and then he's going to afford uh, all of these characters the opportunity to, you know, the Vashia Trailblazer is going to be able to do area, sorry, Armor Bane attack one. Same thing with the Borkon recruits. Prior to the end of the combat round, on she is going to arrive at that planet. He's going to be able to take a swing and kill something, but then Warp Storm plus Clavax War Leader, or we could just see Warp Storm plus Shield Cards means uh, that our Chaos, sorry, our Dark Eldar slash Chaos player is going to win this one. So kind of an odd uh, end to things, but when are we going to see the Clavax? When are we going to see the Warp Storm? There is the Warp Storm, and that may as well be GG right there. Borkon recruits are going to be destroyed. The Vashia Trailblazer are going to be destroyed. There's no opportunity whatsoever to shield those. All of the units at the planet die, and then that's going to be Clavax War Leader, presumably winning the planet for Chris. So if Kith, uh, if Kith or Chris plays that one unit, uh, that is going to be the game for him. So there we go. That is Clavax War Leader. It's going to have an opportunity to take a combat turn. Of course, our uh, Anshi player doesn't have any uh, units present at that planet. So the Clavax War Leader is going to end up winning the battle. It's going to end up capturing Aatrox Prime, and that is going to be the game right there. So GG good game. Very well played to both of our players, but a huge congratulations to Christopher Dale Bates for managing to pilot Packmaster Kith once again to victory. It was a spectacularly well played game by Kevin. It's always great seeing on she in action and, uh, it was pretty interesting just how close he came to winning this one, even in the context of being just destroyed economically. So, my dear viewers, I hope you enjoyed this game. I hope you look forward to much more coverage of the spring 2016 season of Sandman's Black Crusade. This was just the week two featured match. There's six rounds of Swiss in total to go. Unfortunately, because of technical difficulties, we did miss week one, but there are going to be many, many more matches, and out of the uh, 187 entrants, uh, we've got a lot of spectacularly talented players, and I'm sure that the competition is only going to heat up from here. So, thank you as always for watching, and if you enjoyed this content, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel if you've not done so already, or if you are already subscribed, as ever you're encouraged to share this content, because the more engagement these videos receive, the more more likely it is that individuals are going to stumble upon Conquest, they'll be exposed to this living card game, they might give it a try, enjoy what they experience, join our community, and of course, the greater we are in number, the bigger message we send to Fantasy Flight Games, telling them to continue to support this fantastic product. If at any point you'd like to get in touch with me, I would encourage you to do so through Facebook or on Twitter, and if you yourself are a content creator, be sure to get in touch with me 
with me just so I can help promote your content on uh, any form of social media you'd like. So once again, thank you so much for watching. If you ever feel any inclination to help support the Hive Tyrant, I would definitely recommend that you check out my Patreon page. But as always, thank you for watching. And once again, be sure to check back in again soon for much more Conquest LCG content to come.